This past spring, the film adaptation of Richard Wagamese's novel, Indian Horse, hit theaters. For actor Edna Manitowabi, playing the grandmother of a gifted indigenous hockey player in the film was not only a role, but the opportunity to bring the residential school story, a story that is also her own, to a greater audience. Edna Manitowabi is an elder and professor emeritus at the Chani Wenjack School for Indigenous Studies at Trent University, and we're pleased to welcome her to our studio tonight. Welcome. Hi. You are an elder. Yes. I feel kind of strange calling you Edna. <laughs> How can I address you? Edna. Edna Twain. <laughs> <laughs> Before we start the conversation, I'd like to show a clip from the movie Indian Horse. Um, and this is you, who you play Naomi, a grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look, Sheldon. Megdekunik. Got lake. Gijin Kadana. Gin with us. Manidozagigan. She's telling stories. Bye. Indian horse That's blasphemy. We've got to give thanks to Jesus. This was your first film role. What was it like the first time you saw yourself on the big screen? It was uh, pretty incredible, actually. <laughs> I, I thought that uh, the film was uh, pretty, uh, pretty powerful. And just seeing the, the big picture, mm -hmm. seeing the big picture and hearing the language, hearing the language and uh, the images on on the big screen was just pretty incredible. I want to get back to what the movie is about, and obviously language is a big component of that. But I wanted to talk more about you and your acting career. How long have you been acting for? I've, uh, I've done some uh, theater, not very much. Mm -hmm. And um, I did um, uh, someday uh, Drew Hayden Taylor's um, from, from, his, uh, from his book, and uh, that was... Uh, back in the 90s. So actually, that was um, my first uh, initiation into, uh, into performance, that kind of uh, theater. And, and that one had to do with uh, more like um, the 60s scoop. And so I, I wanted to be able to tell that story. And so when this came along, uh, when I was asked, it, actually, it was my sister, my older sister, who. Uh, who suggested that I uh, that audition. I do yeah audition for this part, mm -hmm. and uh, she um, she told uh, somebody called her about it and and uh, she uh, she said uh, well my uh, my sister uh, does that oh, you're a professor uh, we, a professor emeritus and you started acting though in your fifties you're in your seventies now yeah. most people would think you know um, I've heard like acting is you know a young person's it's really difficult to get into the industry. You know, people, when they turn 30, they're worried about not getting any roles. But you started in your 50s. Why did you want to start acting? I started, well, for me, it was more like um, I needed to um, uh, give expression. I needed to find a creative way to, to tell story, to tell our story. And uh, I've always been um, I've always been drawn to the arts as a creative way of not only uh, uh, in terms of creativity and uh, performance, but also healing, because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I I found out about it is that it uh, you you can draw on the energy from uh, uh, from your memories and pull it out of your body and give give voice, give expression to it. And, and acting has allowed you to do that? Acting has allowed me to do that. And mm -hmm. it's allowed me to find 
to find my voice and to bring out. You know, there was a time I struggled with, uh, with that, mm -hmm. just even to uh, um, give expression. What's that like to finally get to a place where you feel like you have a voice and you can give expression to how you're feeling? Oh my goodness, it's just an incredible, incredible feeling because it, uh, it liberates your, your thinking, your mind, your, your, your body. It just uh, seems to uh, set you free. And uh, that's what I found about, uh, about acting, about performance. And, uh, and for me, I guess one of the things that I, um, I relied on was, was ceremony. Um, the big thing was um, the sound of the drum. That's how it affected me, is uh, the vibration, the sound. Mm -hmm. The drum had been silenced uh, in my community for, for I don't know how long. And the first time it sounded in our community, it did something to me. It pierced into the core of my being. And so um, that's, uh, that's where I get that from, mm -hmm. uh, the, the significance and the importance of, of, uh, of sharing that, sharing that, uh, that, uh, that feeling and uh, that message. And something people. that will be around long after you're gone is a movie called Indian Horse. What is the movie about? Indian Horse is about a young boy who is taken and um, he grows up uh, in uh, the residential school. And um, a lot of our people were taken. I, I was one of them at six years old. So the young boy in the, in the, in the movie Indian Horse is, uh, is taken and uh, he, he grows up there until a certain age when he becomes a teenager, then he, he, uh, he goes into um, a, f a foster home. But it's the hockey, it's the sports that, that uh, basically, I guess, uh, saves him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, he gets into the, uh, that, um, into the game of, of hockey and uh, he, um, he eventually becomes uh, really, really good at it. And the movie is based on a novel by Richard Wagamese. Did you ever have a chance to speak to him? He passed away last year. He passed away last year. And uh, I met him years ago when he came and did a talk at, at Trent at the university. And uh, I'll, uh, mind you, that was when he was, uh, when he was younger and, um, I, um, I was quite impressed with his, with his writing. He's such a, a gifted, a gifted uh, human being with his, his writing. And um, I, um, I fell in love with Indian Horse because it, uh, it just, it's, uh, it's um, you can relate to it. And uh, I think a lot of the people who have gone, who have experienced the residential school, it uh, can relate to, to that one, uh, all the different experiences. And uh, not only uh, uh, Saul, the young, the young boy, but uh, uh, Ava Gray Eyes, who plays uh, one of the, uh, the older sisters, I could relate to her. I don't know how long I had to stand in the corner. And the little girl, Lisa, who, who plays the younger sister, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness! It just uh, because you were. I was the little sister. I was the little girl in um, in in residential school. I had an older sister, and there was a disconnect. You couldn't communicate. You no, could, or no. show that you were communicating. There was an invisible line in in the play in the playroom. The older sisters over there, and the younger girls over here. Uh, there was a line. It was invisible, but you knew you couldn't go over there, and so there was that. Uh, that must have been very painful, considering you were six when you went I to was, residential I was school? six years old when I was taken, and um, I remember uh, the look on my mother's face when she put me on the school bus because I was the last one to be taken. Um, four brothers and four sisters, and I was the last one. Nine in total. Yes, and so uh, her, uh, her um, 
responsibility to be a parent was was taken from her. And so um, um, the last of her children is being, is taken and, and the look on her face was just horrendous, a horrific look on her face and the wailing. Mm -hmm. And so there's parts in the story and the movie where I'm asked to do, uh, uh, so I drew on those emotions, on those images, the images of my mother and uh, where I was asked to wail and uh, where uh, I was asked to, uh, um, to uh, bring out uh, certain parts of, uh, in, in the story. And so I dug deep. I dug deep into the core of my being and drew out, drew out those memories, the memories of my mother, the way she, the way she looked and the way she sounded. And uh, what, uh, what an incredible, uh, it's almost as though I, I, I helped her. You helped your mother. I helped my mother. And uh, that, uh, that was uh, in my body. And, and so there was that sense, and that's what I mean by it. it there was that freeing sense. Because and, through the whale, you were uh, you were able to release the pain that your mother felt. Yes, that's the way I I, I felt about that one. It was because it wasn't only uh, once. Stephen uh, Campanelli, the director. <laughs> yeah, I I keep uh, giving him a hard time <laughs> because he put me through, and I did well. I did. I gave it a lot. I gave it my heart and my soul mm -hmm. because I felt. It's uh, my, not only my story, but it's the story of a lot of our people who, have, who were taken and have experienced the residential school. And so uh, I, um, I gave it my all, and uh, I put my whole being into it. And um, so when he asked me to wail, it wasn't only once, it was four, four times, mm -hmm. but they only used a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I, I keep... Uh, I keep uh, teasing him about it and giving him a, a hard time about it, or, or the way he uh, left me lying on the rock. Uh, it seemed like all day my death scene. <laughs> I just have a small part, but it was it was it was pretty incredible. It was just so so. It is a tough story. It's especially uh, since you lived it too. Uh, so to be in that situation and to relive all those mom moments. Well, it triggers you, mm -hmm. it triggers you. A lot of those scenes, the, 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 uh, the child being taken and uh, the bathtub scene, the hair cutting scene, all of those uh, just really, really uh, hit to the core of, of your being and so. I wanna get back to more about the movie, but before uh, I do that, We've been talking about Stephen Campanelli, the director of the movie. Uh, there's been some criti criticism saying that uh, the movie should have had an indigenous director, um, and this was a missed opportunity to do so. What do you think about the criticism? I think um, with, uh, with uh, Richard um, giving his blessing and giving uh, and asking and saying okay to, to the producers that uh, uh, my uh, my uh, my take on that was that he was he was uh, he was giving his blessing. Uh, Cara Mumford um, phrased it uh, quite well when she said, "It's uh, it's not so much an indigenous movie; it is a cross cultural uh, movie." And uh, both um, people working together to to bring out to. Uh, Make sure that the story is is, and he he felt that Stephen really really felt that when when he read the book, he felt this is a story that has to be told, and uh, he felt that uh, how come I didn't know about the history of the original people of this land? How come? And I wonder that myself. How come you never asked? How come you never asked? Uh, about the original people of this land were, yes, we're a minority and uh, a lot of times we've been invisible and we were put aside, we were hidden.
because we were Canada's shame. And so that's why we were, we were, we were Hidden. in the way. Mm -hmm. and, and so hide, hide them and uh, don't. Um, and it's only, for me, it was in the, in the 60s that that's when I heard the sound of the drum. What happened? What made you hear the sound of the drum? Our ceremonies, our dances, our songs were banned. They were outlawed. And even our languages. So we couldn't sing in our own languages. We couldn't dance our own dances. And so um, there were women from my community who uh, felt that uh, they needed to uh, bring uh, the dance, the powwow, back into our community, and basically that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Mind you, we borrowed. We uh, they they searched uh, for dancers and drummers and singers out west in the Cree country, mm -hmm. out in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and they invited them, brought them into to our community, and so when the drum sounded for the first time in my community, on my reservation, we Quemacong on Manitoulin Island. And Manitoulin Island is a very, very powerful, 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 sacred uh, place. And so in our teachings, we're told that that was one of the most, uh, you could hear the drum sounding, the vibration of the drum going out and reaching out all over the island. And uh, so when I heard it for the first time, it did something to me. It, um, it, it brought out uh, um, something. Would and you say, because this is long after you left the reservation, uh, the residential uh, school. Yes. I when was, did you leave the residential school? I, I, I wasn't there for very long. You were there for about three years, right? I was only there for three years. And then now you're an adult at I'm this an, point. I'm 21 and, years and old. And you were a mother at this time? Um, just about. Just about. Just about, yeah. And, um, but I, I think maybe because, um, because I had experienced trauma in my childhood, uh, this is my own um, analysis, um, I wondered about that uh, energy that I felt surging up, but I didn't know what it was, mm -hmm. and so I pushed it back down even though it felt like it just wanted to come out. Something needed to be expressed, and I... You ignored I it? I ignored it. Then I what happened? I, um, I knew something had happened, and I wondered about it. I uh, ended up in, in therapy. I uh, ended up in, um, in um, um, psychiatric hospitals. Um, and counseling, group therapy, and I did that for um, quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I fell in love with um, this therapist that I had at 999 Queen Street, the outpatient department. His name was Farrell Toombs. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was my first elder, I guess I could say. He was non-native and uh, but he's the first human being who ever treated me like a human being, mm. who, who felt, you know, I felt he was genuine and there was, uh, there was, there was compassion. Well, one of the characters in the movie says to an older Saul, he's gotten older now, I think this is towards, you know, after he finishes uh, playing hockey, and the character says to Saul, your silence is killing you. I know it's difficult to talk about these things. Why is it important for you to talk about it? Well, like I said before, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's freeing. It's free it's, and it's healing. And by talking to that counselor, you were able to acknowledge what had happened to you and then be able to look at it. Well, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know. And, and I wasn't looking at the past. I wasn't looking at the residential school. Then. But he knew, he knew from our counseling, from our talking that, I needed to seek out the way he said it was, go look for your culture, go look for your, your elders, go look for your teachers, and uh, there you will find what it is that you're looking for. And did you find what you were looking for? 
I found the stories. Mm -hmm. I found the songs. I found the dances. I found the ceremonies. And I found those things that, that helped me to, to be free. Do you think that saved you? That was my salvation. And that's why I think it's very important for our people to, to tell their stories, to, uh, to be able to share that, those experiences. And uh, no matter how, how sad or whatever, you know, to, uh, to share in the, the singing and the dances because that's what lifts us up. To we, be heard. To be heard. And um, we've been uh, in a dark place for so long. And so when I see those young people, Forrest and Aj and um, Slayton and doing, playing uh, Saul, uh, it just very, very, there's hope. Mm -hmm. There's hope because I see the young people picking it up, doing, doing, doing there. Well, you've said, you know, that when you heard the beat of the drum, it woke up something in you. Your experience in the residential school and everything that came after, how has that affected your own children, your grandchildren? One of the things that I have tried to do since that, um, I sought out ceremonies when, after that, I sought out ceremonies and I sought out people who still hung on to, to uh, their culture, their traditional ways, mm -hmm. the ones that, uh, the elders who have hung on to, to ceremony. And uh, so I sought them out. And uh, that has been my lifelong journey ever since I was 21 when I heard that drum the sound of the drum way back then, it coaxed my heart to, to, uh, to beat and uh, to, uh, to bring out uh, what was, uh, uh, was laying dormant for, for so many, for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, the ceremonies, um, it was in the early 70s that I heard another sound and it was um, the, um, the sound of the water drum. The first time I heard the sound of the water drum, and it goes back to that original one, the one, the one, the first one I heard. Mm -hmm. The it, one that you tried to suppress. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is the one that brought it out. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt as though I was turned upside down like that and shook. And that's what you do with that particular mm -hmm. drum, because it's a water drum. So you want to wet the hide. And so just the act of turning it upside down like that, I felt as though I was turned upside down and shook. And I sobbed and I sobbed when I heard the songs and the language. Uh, it just lifted, it drew, it pulled out, it pulled out uh, what I had suppressed. And I cried all weekend. Every time they dressed the drum, um, I would, the sobbing would start, and there was a sense of home. Hmm. And so I've always, I've always tried to encourage my children, this is home, this is who you are, and pick it up. Pick it up and wear it, live it, put it in your life. And so I encourage them to dance, to powwow, to sing with the drum and jingle dress, hmm. and, uh, all of those and to go to ceremony. To be proud of something that was once, you were once told was not something you should be proud of. Leave that Indian stuff alone, mm -hmm. I was told. What do you want to do? You're the one that's going to get hurt. Because back then it was taboo. You didn't even talk about it. It was hush, hush. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about it. Because the church had a very strong hold on the people. And so any of that stuff is pagan is the work of the devil, it's um, bad medicine. And so it was always negative. To and to honor. grow up in a, in a system where you're told 
you're bad, you're wrong, you're negative, it does affect you at the well, core. Yes. And language is a big thing for you, preserving the language, uh, Anishinaabe. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, preserve that, or how do you even revive it? Uh, when I was, um, uh, one of the things that got me into the university system is the language I was asked to come and teach. And so I did try to teach it uh, initially the way that English is taught, but it doesn't, um, for me, it didn't work. I, I needed to do something else. And so I would take a play and um, um, uh, maybe uh, a play like Loopy and uh, and uh, it's because it's uh, it's a play in in the language. It's Nishnabemwin, and so we would we would uh, the students would uh, would take a part, mm -hmm. and that's how we would act it out. We would perform it. We would role play. We would, uh, and and so I would always encourage them: make sure it's in the body. It's in the body, and and bring it out. Bring it out. You know, it's uh, you'll you'll get it. You'll get it. And. It's been so great speaking to you, Edna. <laughs> Congratulations on the movie. I mean, I think you're a true testament that you can do anything you want. You just have to keep at it. Any more acting roles in the future? It's a leap of faith. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, Indian Horse was a leap of faith. Uh, I just, uh, you, you, you want to do it, uh, you can do it. And uh, you put your heart to it, uh, you can do it. And uh, give, give it what you have and uh, yeah. Well, the movie is available on DVD and Blu-ray. Edna, thank you so much for being here. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.